This is Hermes Bird, a story that was compiled into Teatrum Chemicum Britannicum by Elias Ashmole in 1652, preceded by two introduction sections, a prayer and a preface, which also has an opening plate. At the back of Teatrum Chemicum Britannicum, there are two sections of notes on this, and one is dedicated to merely the opening plate. And there's quite a lot of content there, followed by notes on Hermes Bird. Beginning on the end of page 465, the notes that Elias Ashmole writes are the figure, cut in brass and placed on page 210, is an hieroglyphical device of Kramer, sometime abbot of Westminster, and scholar in this science to Raymond de Lal, which he caused to be painted upon an arched wall in Westminster Abbey, where now the statues of our kings and queens are set in their respective habits. I met with it, limbed in a very ancient manuscript before the old verses that follow, see page 211, which there seemed to serve as a preface to that work which bears the title of Hermes Bird. In it is contained the grand mysteries of the philosopher's stone, and not more popish or superstitious than Flamel's hieroglyphics portrayed upon an arch in St. Innocent's churchyard in Paris. Notwithstanding, it has pleased some to wash the original over with a plasterer's whited brush. As also, of late, to break in pieces the glass window behind the pulpit in St. Margaret's Church at Westminster, wherein was fairly painted, but unhappily mistaken for a popish story, the whole process of the work in this manner. The following is then a description of the painted window, which is extraneous to the story of Hermes' bird in itself. Continuing on the notes of Elias Ashmole on page 467. Hermes' bird, page 213, which piece, as tis thought, was written originally by Raymond Lull or at least made English by the aforementioned Kramer, and that upon this occasion. Kramer, traveling into Italy, fell into the acquaintance of Lull, and so exceedingly wrought upon him by his persuasions that he brought him over to England, where within two years, but after thirty years' erroneous experiments, he obtained the secret from him. And afterwards, bringing Lull into the sight and knowledge of Edward the Third upon some deep engagements and promises that the king entered into to prosecute a war against the Turks in person, to bestow somewhat on the house of God, but nothing in pride or warring against Christians. He was content, permission divin a regimen sua art divit hem facere, which, when the king had obtained, he break his promise, turned his design against France, the first expedition being Anno 1337. And finding that Lull, after he had seen him violate his faith in destroying Christians instead of Mohammedans, refused to further his ambition with new supply of gold, he clapped him up in the tower, where he lay a long time, and seeing no possibility of release, began to study his freedom and to that end made himself a leaper, by which means he gained more liberty and at length an advantage of escaping into France, where in all probability he penned this piece. The whole work is parabolical and elusive, yet truly philosophical, and the bird that it entitles it, the Mercury of the Philosophers, whose virtues and properties are therein largely described. By the word churl is meant the covetous and ignorant artist. The garden is the vessel or glass, and the hedge the furnace. 
Now we return to the beginning of Hermes' bird. The plate, the prayer, and the preface. Beginning with the prayer. In the name of the Holy Trinity, now send us grace, so it be. First God made both angel and heaven, now also the world with planet seven. Man and woman with great sensuality, some of estate and other in her degree, both beast and worm for in the ground grape, every each in his kind to receive his mate. Eagles and fowls in the airy dun fly, and swimming of fish is also in the sea. With vegetable moisture, and of the red grape, and also of the white, whose can him take? All mineral thing that groweth in ground, some to increase and some to make an end. All these bringeth now to our house the mighty stone that is so precious, this rich ruby, that stone of price, the which was sent out of paradise. Thus made the great God of heaven, which all being ruled under planet seven, God send us part of this secret and of that heaven that is sweet. Amen. The Preface If thou wilt this work begin, then scrib thee clean of all thy sin, contrite in heart with all thy thought, and ever think on him that thee dear bought. Satisfaction thou make with all thy might, then three fair flowers thou hast in sight. Yet needeth thee more to thy conclusion. Take thou good heed now to this lesson. Thou must have grace, nature, and reason, speculative and cunning, with good condition. Yet thou must have more now here too, experience with practic, prudent also, patient that thou be, and holy in livings. Think thou on this in thy beginnings, these fourteen hesties, as I thee say, ever keep thou man, both night and day, of thy desires thou mayst not miss, and also of heaven that sweetest bliss. Thus begins Hermes' bird. Problems of old likeness and figures, which proved being fructuous of sentence, and have authority grounded in scripture by resemblance of notable appearance, which moralities concluding on prudence, like as the Bible resources be writing, how trees sometimes choose themselves a king. First in their choice they named the olive, to reign among them, Judicum doth express. But he himself can excuse him blithe, he might not forsake his fatness nor the fig tree his amorous sweetness, nor the vine his wholesome fresh terrage, which giveth comfort to all manner of age. And semblable poets laureate, by dark parables full convenient, feigning that birds and beasts of estate as royal eagles and lions by ascent, sent out writs to hold a parliament, and made degrees briefly for to say, some to have lordship, and some to obey. Eagles in the airy highest take their flight, power of lions on the ground is seen, cedar among trees highest is of sight, and the laurer of nature is ever green, of flowers all flora, goddess and queen. Thus of all things there be diversities, some of estate and some of lower degrees. Poets write wonderful likeness, and covert keep themselves full clothes. They take beasts and fowls to witness of whose feigning fables first arose. And here I cast unto my purpose 
out of the French a tale to translate, which in a pamphlet I read and saw as I sate. This tale which I make of mention, in gross rehearseth plainly to declare three proverbs paid for ransom of a fair bird that was taken a snare. Wonder desirous to escape out of her care. Of mine author following the process, so as it fell in order, I shall express. Willem there was in his small village, as my author make a rehearsal. At Churl the witch had lust and great courage, within himself by his diligent travel, to array his garden with notable repairal, of length and breadth I like square and long, hedged and ditched to make it sure and strong. All the alleys made plain with sand, benches covered with new turf screen, set herbs with condits at the end that wellowed up again the sunshine, like silver streams as any crystal clean. The burbly waves up there one boiling, round as barrel their beams outshoring. Midst the garden stood a fresh laurer, there on a bird singing both day and night, with shining feathers brighter than gold were, which with her song made heavy hearts light, for to behold it was an heavenly sight, how toward even and in the dawning she did her pain most amorous to sing. Esperus enforced her courage toward even when Phoebus went to nest. Amongst the branches, to her advantage, to sing her complain as it was best, and at the rising, to the queen Alcest, to sing again as it was to her due, early on the morrow, the day star to salute. It was a very heavenly melody. Even and more to her the bird sung, and the sweet sugared harmony of uncowed warbles and tweens drew along that all the garden of the noise rung. Till on a morrow that titan shone full clear, the bird was trapped and caught in a panther. The churl was glad that he this bird hath take, merrily of cheer, like and of visage. And in all has he cast for to make within his house a little pretty cage, and with her song to rejoice his courage. And at last the silly bird abrayed, and soberly to the churl she said, I am now take and stand under danger. Hold straight that I may not flee. Adieu my song and all my notes clear, now that I have lost my liberty. Now I am thrall, and sometime was free, and trust well I stand in distress, I cannot sing, nor make no gladness. And though my cage forged were of gold, and the pinnacles of barrel and crystal, I remember a proverb said of old, Who lest his freedom, in sooth he is in thrall. For me had rather upon a branch small, merrily to sing among the woods green, then in a cage of gold, bright and chain. Song and prison have no accordance. Trust thou, I will sing in prison, song precedent of joy and pleasance. And prison causeth death and destruction. Raining of fetters maketh no merry sound. Or how should he be glad and jocund against his will that lieth in chains bound? What availeth a lion to be a king of beasts, fast shut in a tower of stone alone, or an eagle under straight chains, called also the king of fowls ever each one? Fie on lordship, when liberty is gone, answer here too, and it not a start. Who singeth merry that singeth not with heart? If thou wilt rejoice thee of my singing, let me go fleeing free from danger, and every day in the morning I will repair to thy lorer, and freely to sing with notes clear, under thy chamber or afore thy hall, 
every season when thou list me call. To be shut and pinned under dread, no thing according to my nature. Though I were fed with milk and wassail bread, and sweet crudis brought to my pasture, yet had I rather do my best secure. Early in the morrow, to scrape in the veil, to find my dinner amongst the worms small. The laborer is gladder at his plow, early on the morrow, to feed him on bacon. Then some bean, that have treasure I know, and of all dainties plenty and poison, and no freedom with his possession. To go at large, but as bear at the stake, to pass his bonds, but if he leave take. Take this answer full for conclusion. To sing in prison thou shalt not me constrain, till I have freedom in woods up and down, to flee at large on boughs, both rough and plain, and of reason thou shouldst not disdain of my desire, but laugh and have good game. But who is a churl, would every man were the same? Well, quoth the churl, since it will not be that I desire by my talking, meager thy will, thou shalt choose one of three, within a cage merrily to sing, or to the kitchen I shall thy bode bring. Pull thy feathers that been so bright and clear, and after roast or bake thee to my dinner. Then, quoth the bird, to reason I say not nay, touching my song a full answer thou hast. And when my feathers pulled bean away, if I be roasted or bake in a paste, thou shalt of me have a small repaste. But if thou wilt work by my counsel, thou mayest by me have great avail. If thou wilt to my ready assent, and suffer me go freely for prison, without ransom or any other rent, I shall thee give a notable great guerdon, the three great wisdoms according to reason. More of value take heed what I proffer, than all the gold that is shut in thy coffer. Trust me well, I shall thee not deceive. Well, quoth the churl, tell and let see. Nay, quoth the bird, a foreign conceive. Who shall teach of reason he must go free? It fitteth a master to have his liberty, and at large to teach his lesson. Have me not suspect I mean no treason. Well, quoth the churl, I hold me content. I trust the promise which thou hast made to me. The bird flew forth, the churl was of scent, and took her flight up to the lower tree. Then thought she thus, Now that I stand free, with snares panters, I cast not all my life, nor with no lime twigs, no more to strife. He is a fool that scaped his danger, that broke his fetters and fled his from prison, for to resort again, for burnt child dreads fire. Each man beware of wisdom and reason, of sugared strawed that hideth false poison. There is no venom so perilous in sharpness, as when it hath triacle of likeness. Who dreadeth no peril, in peril he shall fall, smooth waters being of fishes deep. The quail pipe can most falsely call, till the quail under the net doth creep. A blared fowler, trust not though he weep. Eschew his thumb, of weeping take no heed, that small birds can nip by the heed. And now that I such danger am scaped, I will beware how to for provide, that of no fowler I will no more be jabed, from their lime twigs to fly far aside, their peril is peril to abide. Come near, thou churl, take heed to my speech of three wisdoms that I shall thee teach. Give not of wisdom to hasty credence, to every tale, nor each tiding, but consider of reason and prudence. 
Among tales is many a great leasing. Hasty credence hath caused great hindering. Report of tales and tidings brought up new maketh many a man full one true. For one part take this for my ransom. Learn the second grounded of scripture. Desire thou not by no condition thing that is impossible to recure. Worldly desires stand all in adventure. And who desireth to soar high aloft, oft time by sudden turn he falleth on soft. The third is this, beware both even and moral, forget it not, but learn this of me. For treasure lost, make never too great sorrow, which in no wise may not recovered be. For who that takes sorrow for loss in that degree reckon first his loss and after reckon his pain. Of one sorrow he maketh sorrows twain. After this lesson the bird began a song of her escape greatly rejoicing. And she remembered her also of the wrong done by the troll, first at her taking, and of the affray and of her imprisoning, glad that she was at large and out of dread, said unto him, hovering above his head. Thou were, quoth she, a very natural fool to suffer me to part of thy lewdness. Thou oughtest of right to complain and make dole, and in thy heart have great heaviness, that thou hast lost so passing great riches which might suffice by value and wrecking to pay the ransom of a mighty king. There is a stone which is called Regounts, of old engendered within mine entrail, which of fine gold poseth a great ounce, citrine of colors like garnets of entail, which maketh men victorious in battle. And who that beareth on him this stone is full assured to gain his mortal phone. Who that hath this in possession shall suffer no poverty nor non indigence, but of treasure have plenty and poison, and every man shall don him reverence, and non enemy shall don him non offence. But from thy hands, now that I am gone, plain give thou wilt, for thy part is none. As I thee abraid here before of a stone now that I had, the which now thou hast for lore, be all reason thou shouldst been sad, and in thy heart nothing glad. Now, churl, I thee tell in my device, I was arid and bred in sweet paradise. Now more names I shall thee tell of my stone that I call Regounce, and of his virtuous and his smell, that being so sweet and so odiferous. With Enoch and Eli hath been my service, my sweet song that soundeth so sharp, with angel's voice that passeth any harp. The negrum diamond that is in Morian's fees, and the white carbuncle that rolleth in wave, the citrine ruby of rich degrees that passeth the stone of common sair in the lapidary is grown by old La. He passeth all stones that is under heaven after the course of kind by the planet seven. It is for none, churl, to have such treasure that exceedeth all stones in the lapidary, and of all virtues he beareth the flower. With all joy and grace it maketh man merry that in this world shall never be sorry. Now, very churl, thou passest thy grace, I am at my liberty even as I was. As clerks findeth in the Bible, at paradise it is when he was cast by an angel, both fair and still, adown King Alexander there I thrust, and of all stones it was I lost. Such stones in place few bean I brought, sorrowful is the churl, and heavy in his thought. Now more churl it tell I can, and thou wilt to me take heed. The bird of Hermes is my name, 
in all the world that is so wide, with glittering of grace by every side, whose me might have in his cover tower, he were richer than any emperor. Alexander, the conqueror, my stone smote down upon his helm when he piped, no more than a piece that is so round, it was there to no manny sight that leads so plain the manly knight. Now I tell thee, with melody stiven, his mighty grace came out from heaven. It causeth love, and maketh men gracious, and favorable in every man's sight. It maketh accord of two folks envious, comforteth sorrowful, and maketh heavy hearts light, like passing of color sunny bright. I'm a fool to tell thee at once, or to teach a churl the price of precious stones. Men shall not put a precious margaret, as rubies, sapphires, and other stones eind, emeralds, nor round pearls white, before rude swine that love dress of kind, for a sow delighteth her as I find, more in foul dress, her piggies for to glad, than all the perry that comes out of Grenade. Each thing draws to his semblable, fishes to the sea, beasts on the strand. The air for fowls is commendable, to the plowman for to till his land, and to a churl a muck fork in his hand. I lose my time any more to tarry, to tell thee beware of the lapidary. That thou hadst, thou gettest no more. Thy lime twigs and panters I defy. To let me go, thou, where fowls seen over, to lose the riches only of folly, I am now free to sing and to fly, where that my list, and he is a fool at all, that goeth at large, and maketh himself thrall. To hear of wisdom, thine ears be half deaf, like a naif that listeth upon an arp. Thou must go pipe in an ivy leaf. Better is to me to sing on thorns sharp than in a cage with a churl to carp. For it was said of folk many years ago, a churl's churl is oft woe begone. Now, churl, I have thee here told my virtues here with great experience. It were to some man better than gold. To thee it is no fructuous a sentence. A sheep's crook to thee is better than a lance. A Jew now globe with heart sore, in churl's clutches come I never more. The churl felt his heart part in twain, for very sorrow, and in sunder rive. Alas, quoth he, I may well weep and plain, as a wretch never liked to thrive but for to endure in poverty all my life. For of folly and of willfulness, I have now lost all wholly my riches. I was a lord, I cry out on fortune, and had great treasure laid in my keeping, which might have made me long to contune with that ilk stone to have lived a king, if I had set it in a ring. Born it upon me, I had God, I know. Then, should I no more have gone to the plow? When the bird saw the churl thus mourn, that he was heavy of his cheer, she take her flight and again return toward him and said, as ye shall hear, O dull churl, wisdom for to leer, that I thee taught, all is left behind, raised away and clean out of thy mind. Taught I thee not this wisdom in sentence, to every tale brought up of new, not to hastily give not there to credence, unto time thou know it be true? All is not gold that showeth gold's hue, nor stones all by nature as I find, being not sapphires that showeth color eind. In this doctrine I lost my labor, to teach thee such proverbs of substance. Now mayest thou see thy lewd blind error, for all my body poised in balance, weigheth not an ounce, 
glued is thy remembrance. Yet have I more poise closed in mine entrail than all my body set for countervail. All my body weigheth not an ounce. How might I have then in me a stone that poseth more than doth a great regouts? Thy brain is dull, thy wit almost gone. Of three wisdoms thou hast lost one. Thou shouldst not after my sentence to every tale give too hastily credence. I bade also beware both even and moral, for thing lost by sudden adventure thou shouldst not make too much sorrow. When thou sayest, thou mayest not it recover, here thou failest which doth thy busy cure. In the snare to catch me again, thou art a fool, thy labor is in vain. In the third also thou dost rave, I bade thou shouldst in no manner wise covet thing, the which thou mayst not have, in which thou hast forgotten mine empress. That I may say plainly to device, thou hast in madness forgotten all three notable wisdoms that I taught thee. It were but folly more with thee to carp, or to teach of wisdoms more or less. I hold him mad that brings forth his harp, thereon to teach a road for dollard ass, and mad is he that singeth a fool a mass, and he is most mad that doth his business to teach churl the terms of gentleness. And semblably in April and in May, when gentle birds most make melody, but the cacao can sing but too lay. In other tunes she hath no fantasy, thus everything as clerks do specify, as fruit on the trees and folk of every age. From whence they come they have a tellage. The winter treateth of his wellsome winds, of the gentle fruit boasts the gardener, the fisher casteth his hooks and his lines to catch fish in the fresh river. Of tilleth the land treateth the power. The gentleman treateth of gentry. The churl delighteth to speak ribaudry. All one to a falcon and a kite. As good an owl as a popinjay. A dunghill duck as daintieth as a snipe. Who serves a churl has many a woeful day. I cast me never hereafter more with thee play, to for a churl any more to sing, of wisdom to carp in my living. The folk that shall this fable see and read, new forged tales I counsel them to flee, for loss of good, take not too great heed, be not too sorrowful for noon adversity. Covet no thing that may not be. And remember where you go, a churl's churl is oft will be gone. Unto purpose this proverb is full rife, read and reported by old remembrance. A child's bird and a churl's wife hath oftenest sorrow and mischance. Who hath freedom? hath sufficiency. Better is freedom with little and gladness than to be a churl with all worldly riches. Go, little choir, and recommend me to my master with humble affection. Be seeking him lowly of mercy and pity, of this rude making to have compassion. And as touching this translation out of the French, Howsoever the English be, all thing is said under correction with supportation of your benignity. Finis.